also a subgroup of patients with chronic pain who are on opiates do extremely well. They don't develop use disorders, they don't misuse, they don't abuse you know, their medications. But about 8 to 10 percent of patients who are exposed to opiates go on to develop an opioid use disorder. So that's going to be about 97 million people. So that's not inconsequential. So a lot of the guidelines, like the new CDC guidelines and guidelines from the American Academy of Pain Medicine and Pain Society, have all talked about risk assessment. So what we have today are, are, are several factors that a good clinical interview, review of medical records, uh, prescription drug monitoring plans, urine toxicology, and also the use of screening tools. And so there's been a lot of screening tools like the opioid risk tool, the SOAP, the DIER, a number of things. The problem is, is that those tools were developed in pain patients or populations of pain patients who did not have an opioid use disorder. They may have engaged in aberrant drug-related behaviors that could mean lots of things. It could be self-treatment for sleep, for depression, for you know, anxiety. Um, so they weren't specific for that. So I had a large uh, R01 grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse looking at phenotypic and genotypic markers of addiction in patients that have chronic pain on opiates. So we enrolled about a thousand patients who had been on long-term opioid therapy that never developed a use disorder. And we have about 600 patients who had no past history of substance abuse, got exposed to opiates when they had pain, and went on to develop a full-blown opioid use disorder. So this is a unique population, ones who did and did not, because most people don't have this kind of data. Um, so we had not done the genetic uh, profiling, but the phenotypic or the non-genetic uh, factors have been really interesting. For example, Patients who develop an opioid use disorder and chronic pain are much higher in catastrophizing than ones that don't. And catastrophizing is linked to opioid craving. Catastrophizing is linked to increased risk of suicide. Interestingly, we took the opioid risk tool developed by Lynn Webster and we, we tried to validate it on this population. So when Lynn, uh, Dr. Webster uh, did this, it was again pain patients who engaged in aberrant behaviors, not patients who had an opioid use disorder. And what we found is just using the ORT, the opioid use risk tool, that it was a, had an odds ratio of about 1.6 in predicting whether you developed an opioid use disorder. Not bad. One of the ORT questions is about pre-adolescent sexual abuse, but only in women. And that came from one study that was outdated and really isn't relevant to the patients who have use disorders. It's called ACE, which is Adverse Childhood Events, and that really is a factor. So we took out that question, and also we got a lot of feedback that a lot of female patients didn't want to answer that question. It caused too much trauma. So we took that question out because it wasn't really relevant and re and reanalyzed the data. And it's, again, the odds ratio of predicting who developed a use disorder was about 1.6. The next step is that his, uh, Dr. Webster sort of ballparked weighting the items, like two to one, men to women, men to women, and we took all of that out and it was just yes to no, you know, so no sexual abuse question, yes or no for these factors that are kind of risk factors for substance abuse, and the odds ratio went to over three. Second part of this is that we looked at smoking, because we know that smoking, and most of the risk stratifications don't include smoking, which is interesting to me. Um, so we looked at, at whether you've had a cigarette the last seven days yes or no. So 80% of the patients who developed a use disorder said yes, and only about 20-some percent of the, of the ones who did not develop it said yes. We held all the other risk factors that we collected for use disorders out, and just that question, whether you smoke or not, um, had an odds ratio over 9 of predicting opioid use disorder. And it makes sense from a neuroscience perspective because Smoking kind of stimulates or sensitizes the dopaminergic system, which underlies addiction. And so the system is already sensitized, and now they get exposed to opiates and puts them at much greater risk. So that's kind of where the future is, I think, in risk stratification. The genetics is still very fuzzy. We haven't, we haven't got the, the, uh, the test yet that we can spit in a cup and say, well, you're going to develop this or you're not going to develop this. But I think some of these breakthroughs are going to really change the way that physicians look at patients when they're prescribing opiates and have much better tools to deal with this. Because not only are you trying to find people who are at risk to make sure they don't get into trouble, but you also want to protect the patients who do really well on opiates. And so when we're doing risk stratification, it's not just finding out who's going to develop a use disorder, but it's protecting access for patients who benefit from opiates, which is a very hot topic in this day and age.